Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another special interview episode from MediaMonarchy.com. My name is James Evan Pilato, and I'm the host and webmaster of the site and show, MediaMonarchy.com. And it is Thursday, October 8th, 2009, and on the line with us from Florida is author Peter Lavenda. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. I have been such a fan of your three-volume set called Sinister Forces. And for the last couple of years, it's always pretty much been within arm's reach. And whenever I see things happen in the news that I know are are reverberating from the sort of murky past of 20th century American history, I can just jump to the indices of the books and start to look up some of the names and places, and I start to see the dots connect. So essentially what really made me want to get in touch with you now was the last weekend of September, I saw this confluence of stories concerning the death of Susan Atkins in prison, one of the main Manson murders. And then the next day, we saw a strange story come out about John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas and accusations of incest between he and his daughter, Mackenzie Phillips. And then the third day, seemingly, suddenly, Roman Polanski was arrested in Switzerland. Can you give us kind of a rundown of of why these things all seem to swirl around as we've just kind of passed the 40th anniversary of the Tate LaBianca murders and, and all of this? Wow. Well, there's just so much to cover, you know, uh, because these are all connections. Um, it, what happens is you start to find yourself making connections outside of the connections and pretty soon you get lost in a morass of connections. But the, the, the thing that jumps out at you, of course, is Polanski set the stage. So the Susan Atkins um, uh, death also is intimately related. Susan Atkins, of course, was one of the murderers who was present at the Tate uh, killings. Uh, along with uh, Tex Watson, uh, Linda Kasabian, Patricia Krenwinkel. Uh, these were all people involved in the very famous Sharon Tate murders at Roman Polanski's home uh, at uh, 150 CLO Drive. And so we have the, this bizarre connection of Polanski getting arrested in virtually the same week that um, Susan Atkins dies in prison. Uh, one of the more... Um, how shall I put it? One of the more horrific um, crimes um, of the 20th century, as far as uh, you know, criminal acts, but also something that is so so uh, seminal to our experience. You know, uh, people of our generation, my generation, who grew up uh, in the 1960s. Uh, for us, uh, you know, Charles Manson, the, the Tate LaBianca killings were sort of the death knell to the 60s. I mean, that was it. It was uh, Woodstock was on one end and Altamont was on the other, you know, and and with Altamont, you had uh, you had the Polanski killings. You had the Charles Manson attempt, to, according to Bugliosi, to create race war. And then, of course, you have the, uh, the Mamas and the Papas uh, connection as well with the uh, with um, with John Phillips and you know Mackenzie Phillips writing this biography saying that her father abused her, I mean Manson was part of that milieu. Manson was uh, had a song that was recorded by the Beach Boys. He was a friend of Dennis Wilson. Uh, if you go and you look through your old Beach Boys recordings, those of you who have any, uh, and you start thumbing through them, you're going to find on one of the albums a, a song called "Never Learn Not to Love." Now, that very nice-sounding title was the one the Beach, the Beach Boys eventually chose, but that's a Charles Manson song. He wrote the music and the lyrics, and the Beach Boys recorded it. Manson was involved with the music scene in a very uh, aggressive way. He wanted to become a major recording star. I, I used the, the example of Adolf Hitler in Vienna trying to become a famous artist, a famous painter, and rejected constantly by the authorities there as someone who had virtually no talent. And then we have Charles Manson on the other side of the world trying to become a rock music star. Both of these failed artists then go on to commit mass murder. Uh, it's it's they sort there's of, some it yes. sort of creates almost and and Hitler's paintings are beautiful and listening to some of the original Charles Manson music is actually it's really beautiful and both those things I think yes create the the big what ifs what if Hitler had gotten into art school or what if Charles Manson had broken into the music scene would all of these things kind of been averted but please continue well well you're, you're exactly right that's the idea I mean 
if uh, if Manson had gotten into into you know become a musician, he would have been uh, there would have been no need for Marilyn Manson. <laughs> I mean, Charlie would have done it all. I think he would have gotten in. He would have become a musician. But I think his natural tendency towards aggression would still have been there. You know, so I think this would still have been uh, uh, an issue. I mean, um, Manson once claimed very uh, um, profoundly, I think, that he was convicted of witchcraft in the 20th century. And I think Manson saw himself that way. Um, we have a problem with Charles Manson. We, we, we look at him, we see his interviews, especially the ones in the last 10 years or so. Uh, we're convinced this man is absolutely insane. I mean, he is a scary guy. He's lost touch with reality a long time ago, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, if we're really um, specific about the crimes that he was uh, said to have committed, that he was convicted of, he was not present uh, at the Tate-LaBianca crime scene, you know, for the actual murders of themselves. Uh, he wasn't present for the murders of the LaBianca family. He was not there. Uh, he set up both of them. He, t he gave the addresses, from what I understand, from the evidence that I can put together, to uh, Tex Watson as to exactly where he should go and what they should do. So he gave the orders like a mafia don. But we have a tendency to, to, to lump Charles Manson in with serial killers. And that's kind of a tough one to prove in this case. Uh, was Manson really a serial killer if he didn't actually commit the murders himself? So we have somebody who on the one hand wants to become uh, internationally known as a recording artist, on the one hand, who learned how to play guitar in prison um, I think from one of the original members of um, um, uh, the the, uh, the the criminal organization that was headed by, uh, they just made a movie about him uh, with Johnny Depp oh, called Public Enemy. Dillinger. Dillinger, of course. There we go. Okay, so uh, John, one of John Dillinger's gang members taught Charlie how to play the guitar. Um, so this is a very strange connection as well. But one, you know, you're in prison, you're going to find a lot of strange people. But uh, so there's Manson on the one hand learning how to play the guitar. And on the other hand, going through Scientology auditing at the same time. Right? Now, now I feel, I feel this, is, this is really key. This is one of those points that most folks have, have never really heard about, that Charles Manson claimed to be a, a clear in yes. Scientology. Yes, yes, he did. In fact, one of the, when the Scientology offices were raided by the FBI back in the 1970s, I believe it was, they came across documentation that showed the Scientologists were very nervous about the fact that there was a connection between Manson and Scientology, and they wanted that quashed as much as possible. Um, Scientology has other um, skeletons in the closet going back to L. Ron Hubbard's you know, early days, but the Manson connection was one that really got them very nervous. Uh, Manson did undergo Scientology auditing in prison. Uh, in fact, it, it affected him so deeply at one point he was begging the authorities to put him in solitary because his auditor was driving him insane. Uh, and the person who eventually was connected with this, with Manson in prison and Scientology, then later became a friend of uh, Squeaky Fromm, or Frommy, as her name's actually pronounced, the woman who uh, attempted the assassination of Gerald Ford, and who was herself a member of Manson's family, a, a devoted member of Manson's family, I mean, up to the present day. Now, if, if I can interject, my first probably conscious realization of, of the Manson family and, so, and the, the story surrounding it, and I'm 32 years old, but as a young kid in rural southern West Virginia, I'm born and raised West Virginia, I remember my parents at some point saying, oh, Squeaky Frome got out of prison. Right. And so as a kid, you know, all I knew was some crazy killer broke out of jail in West Virginia. So I, of course, thought they were going to come around. Now, she's recently been released from prison. Right. And we saw... Susan Atkins vying to to be released from prison, I believe, due to her physical health. She was denied and then seemed to actually die about just one month later. Yes. So I, I suppose it's interesting that, you know, Sarah Jane Moore, she attempted to assassinate Gerald Ford and she's been let out of prison. Squeaky Fromm, she kind of attempted to assassinate Gerald Ford and she's been let out of prison. She essentially was the sort of treasure, if you will, for the Manson family? Didn't she sort of dispense some of the blades on that evening that would be used? 
Yes, Squeaky was the Squeaky was the person that I think Charlie relied upon the most to keep the family together in an operational or logistical way. I mean, Manson was the charismatic leader, but it was Squeaky who kept everything running smoothly. Squeaky was a true believer. I mean, no no question about it. I mean, she kept up uh, the uh, the pressure on on publicity and everything else in favor of Manson for for decades after his arrest. Even though she was arrested herself, she never lost the faith. Um, and she, interestingly to me, because of my research, wound up in prison in, in Moundsville, West Virginia, um, which is an interesting place because of the Indian burial mound connections, and that goes back to Ashland, Kentucky, and where Charlie Manson grew up, um, and all the other associations that have come out, you know, concerning them. Well, and that for me, and I know, is something that is that is fundamental to Book One of Sinister Forces. And something that perhaps we could do another time, I would love to probably just do a whole talk about the bizarre connections to my home state of West Virginia. But Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but barring that, for, for now, if we can sort of, and if we maybe got ahead there for folks, the central, I think, thesis of the Sinister Forces books, because you just hit there with, with Moundsville and with Kentucky, can you kind of just give a thumbnail sketch of, of the thesis of Sinister Forces and the, and, and the land and perhaps the soul of America? Sure. Um, initially, I became interested in this subject uh, during Watergate, which goes to show you how old I am. So during Watergate and during um, the, the, the hearings that were taking place, I saw a lot of names that were familiar or organizations that were familiar to me from before. I remember where I was, for instance, during the uh, the John F. Kennedy assassination. So I was 13 years old when Kennedy was assassinated. And I had heard about, of course, Bay of Pigs. I heard about the anti-Castro Cubans, and all, et cetera, et cetera. And all of the conspiracy stuff uh, has been you know, denied by mainstream historians. And in some cases, rightly so. Some of it is just off the wall. But in other cases, the circumstantial evidence was so big that there was something else taking place that I started to ask myself, is this a conspiracy that we're talking about in normal terms? Is it coincidence? And, you know, if so, does the word coincidence really mean anything or explain anything? Or is there a third way of looking at this? Uh, do historical events um, cast ripples in, in, in time? Uh, both going towards the past and towards the future. Does a major event like this have connections leading out into other directions? So I started to to investigate webs of connectivity, uh, matrices of, of connections between political events and in some cases cultural events. And I came up with the theory, I mean the, the reaction that to my way of thinking, our country, the United States of America is a kind of haunted house uh, we're haunted. We're we're populated by ghosts, um, and we walk among these this this haunted landscape, oblivious to what's really taking place. We have had civilizations in our in our geographical area in the United States that are older than Stonehenge, older than the pyramids, and we basically don't recognize it. We don't we don't see it, and we tend to believe that you know. Places like Stonehenge, places like the, the pyramids of Egypt, these are spooky places, these are sacred sites, these are places where odd things take place. And yet, here we are in our own country, we're surrounded by the same, the same types of webs of connectivity, um, where individuals, as I detailed extensively in Sinister Forces through the CIA's mind control programs like MKUltra, Operation uh, uh, Bluebird, Artichoke, and all the others, and some of the other military and intelligence agency programs, were designed to probe the human mind and its powers and its capabilities, uh, just the way the ancient priests of Egypt did, or the Druids of uh, England, or any of these places that are so popular. Um, to to mystics and to occultists and to the New Age uh, consciousness stuff. Um, if you start to look at the United States from the same point of view, you realize that we're awash in the same the same things. Uh, Scientology, since we mention it, is just one example of the type of um, spiritual currents that run through our country. So when political events take place, assassinations, um, when uh, um, Manson family things show up, the Son of Sam killings and all of this, can we successfully isolate these things and say that was an isolated case? Charles Manson was crazy, his followers were crazy, they committed some horrible crimes, we caught them, end of story. Is that really the end of the story? Is the, the David Berkowitz, Son of Sam case, uh, Berkowitz said he was guilty, 
We arrested him. We threw him in jail. End of story. Was it really the end of the story? When you find out that it wasn't the end of the story, that events like the Manson family and the Son of Sam case could be connected. When you see connections spiraling outwards to Roman Polanski, who, after all, was the director of the film Rosemary's Baby, uh, which opened, you know, shortly within a year before the his wife was murdered. Uh, he was in England at the time filming uh, Day of the Dolphins. He was working on the film The Day of the Dolphins. He had to stop work because of the of the murders. But The Day of the Dolphins is about a political assassination. It's about using dolphins, you know, to commit to to assassinate the president of the United States. And we and we do know that from just some of the declassified, you know, military experiments of some of the more seemingly bizarre things of things we've tried to do with animals. I think there was something called acoustic kitty, you know, of trying to. Oh, yeah. So, again, you know, these things that seem kind of funny. Oh, and we'll we'll have the film opening soon, The Men Who Stare at Goats, about remote viewing and and all of that. And, of course, it'll be turned into, ha-ha, isn't that funny? And it's sort of a, a, a whitewash. Sure. But if we're, okay, so we're now, we are now back to Polanski, and you've mentioned Rosemary's Baby. One thing I do want to throw out. I have a book here called Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film. I find it really fascinating just as kind of media studies, and it breaks down the sort of main subgenres within horror. And one of the numerous bits about Rosemary's Baby that I found interesting, and the book, I should say, is by Carol Glover, and she mentions that what distinguishes Rosemary's Baby from the -the run-of-the-mill possession film the possession film usually following the tenets of it's the woman's body that's on the line in the possession film, but it's more about the male psyche. So, of course, like The Exorcist, Reagan is possessed, but it's more about Father Karras. Right. So she says that what distinguishes Rosemary's Baby from the -the run-of-the-mill possession film is the fact that Guy, Rosemary's husband, plays a secondary role and that he is not a resistor of the supernatural, but its first dupe. So, yes. in the film, he is duped, of course, by the neighbors. Of course, for those who hasn't, haven't seen it, they, they, of course, should. Also, of course, we'll sidebar mention that it was shot in the Dakota building, where John Lennon would be murdered a few decades later. The idea that perhaps Roman Polanski was a dupe of the occult, and not a resistor, and even perhaps not necessarily a, a participant... But when we look at the involvement of Sharon Tate in films by Kenneth Anger that have the involvement of people like Anton LaVey, we know that he and his, or rather just he, you know, escaped the Holocaust. Polanski almost seems to have a a, a curse. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, is Polanski a, a dupe of the occult or even a facilitator? In a sense, uh, in, in a way, Guy in, in the book and in the film was a facilitator of of the um, possession of Rosemary. Um, Polanski's uh, involvement with Sharon Tate. I mean, the first film that she shows up in is um, with Polanski is a film called The Fearless Vampire Killers, which is kind of a spoof on vampire films. But Sharon Tate is a sort of an ingenue in that film. She shows up in that film uh, already in an occult film with Polanski. During that time, according to what uh, I've been told, she was involved briefly with uh, the witchcraft cult in England while they were filming um, Fearless Vampire Killers and an earlier film called 13, Eye of the Devil. She was in that also. So Sharon Tate had this, you know, run of occult films and involvement with uh, witchcraft uh, organizations to a certain extent. Not that she was a car-carrying member, not that she was a fanatic follower of occultism, but definitely she had had the exposure, and she had had the exposure psychologically to these two films. And then, of course, Polanski is out there directing Rosemary's Baby with Mia Farrow. Um, so there's a whole other you know, uh, current running around Polanski himself, and as well uh, around Sharon Tate. Uh, if you look at the, at the Polanski film of Rosemary's Baby, we have a young woman, um, uh, also sort of an ingenue type, an innocent type, uh, a, a Midwestern girl uh, who comes to New York, marries an actor, uh, and then is impregnated by the devil, more or less, and then becomes pregnant with the devil's baby. Well, Sharon Tate was murdered. She was eight or nine months into her pregnancy. A blonde woman from uh, the Midwest, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, following a lot of the same pattern. And 
there was a connection between Rosemary's Baby and the Church of Satan under Anton LaVey. And Susan Atkins, who was one of the murderers of the of Sharon Tate, had originally been filmed at a black mass that was being given by Anton LaVey for the Church of Satan. There are still uh, still photographs of her participation there. So there's this weird web of connections that spirals out from this event. You know, where we have Susan Atkins with the Church of Satan. The Church of Satan then showed up at the premiere of Rosemary's Baby. Um, it was, I think, the Walpurgis knocked. It was April 30th, if I'm not mistaken. So they showed up en masse. I mean, en masse, no pun intended, but <laughs> there was a, a number of them showing up in their, their, all their black and gothic glory going to the, uh, to the opening of this film. And that, of course, was hyped by the media a great deal as well. So we have the Polanski, Sharon Tate, occult uh, connection there. And then this tentative connection to an assassination film called Day of the Dolphins. And then, of course, in 1968, in June of 1968, we have just a few months, uh, no, about uh, a year before the killings, we have Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate uh, at a dinner party. This this blows my mind. So I just this is one of those things that again when I mention it to people, you can't explain these kind of things away. Well, you can't. This is the problem. This is why if we talk about coincidence, we talk about conspiracy. Neither of these two explanations really does this justice. But anyway, there's a dinner party. Uh, the dinner party is given by John Frankenheimer, famous Hollywood director, who had directed the original film version of the Manchurian Candidate that novel by Richard Condon about brainwashing Korean uh, prisoners of war. Uh, A guy is brainwashed uh, in the film version. It's Lawrence Harvey. He comes back from Korea. He's hailed as a great American hero, but he's actually a programmed assassin, programmed by the communists to kill a presidential candidate. Well, Frankenheimer had gone to Jack Kennedy and said, look, we're going to make this film, but I won't make it if you think it's just not a good thing to do since you're involved with the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis and the SALT Treaty and all the rest of it. And Kennedy said, don't worry about it. Make the film. It came out in 1962. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. The film was pulled out of uh, distribution and was not seen again for 30 years. Well, now, and the, we have to, of course, mention that this is a different era when a film was not circulating around in the 35 millimeter cans. That was it. Oh, yeah. There were no DVDs. <laughs> you know, there was no YouTube version. It was gone. It was just pulled out. That was all. Uh, and it starred Frank Sinatra, Angela Lansbury, Lawrence Harvey. These were all names to conjure with in those days. And still the film was pulled out. Uh, Sinatra wanted it pulled out. Sinatra, who had loved Jack Kennedy, saw too many eerie connections between the film and the reality. So he also wanted it pulled. Everybody wanted it pulled. They pulled the film. So in 1968, now it's five years after the assassination of Robert Kennedy, Frankenheimer's giving a, a dinner party. Or a, at oh, the dinner John party. Kennedy. Sorry. Five Excuse years me? after the assassination of John Kennedy. Of John Kennedy, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he's giving a dinner party, Frankenheimer, for Robert Kennedy. And at the dinner party is Robert Kennedy, I think four of Kennedy's children and his wife. And also at the dinner party is Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski. So they're all having dinner together. And within 24 hours, Bobby Kennedy would be assassinated because that was his last supper. That was the evening of the election where they were voting in California to see if he would win the California primary which, of course, he did. Uh, He went back to the hotel. Uh, He gave his famous speech on to Chicago, and within moments, he was murdered. So you can imagine what's going through Frankenheimer's head, you know. So, you know, here I do the film about uh, an assassination, and Jack gets assassinated. And now I have, you know, Bobby Kennedy over to dinner, and he gets assassinated. But at the same time, of course, there's that awful connection. There's Sharon Tate, Roman Polanski, Bobby Kennedy, John Frankenheimer, all in one place, all on that very, very important day in which we saw American political history uh, changed quite significantly with the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. They're all having dinner together. Uh, What a strange painting that would make, you know, Uh, just painting all the figures hanging out like one of those paintings where you see Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley and James Dean, you know. Here's a a dinner party uh, with all of these doomed individuals. Now, because, where yes. where is this uh, document? I mean, is this this is publicly available knowledge that on that evening they were they were together? Oh yes, this is. There's no mystery about it. Sure. Okay. You can you can research this uh, anywhere. You can Google it up, and you'll find it. Okay. 
Because because I I do want to just kind of throw in there. I w- I was talking about my upcoming interview with you and talking about sinister forces with a, a great friend of mine back east. But he's generally a skeptic when it comes to anything you know even coming close to quote unquote conspiracy theory. Sure. And I I sent him the sort of entry, and I don't know if it was off of. Amazon or Trinday.com, the publisher of, of the three books, which is Chris Milligan from, from also right. from here in Oregon. My friend scanned over and he was like, how, could, how can you cover all that? You can't cover all that in one book. How does he do that? <laughs> well, it, it's important. I mean, my people have a problem with my trilogy because there's a lot of information in there. Um, and my intention for this, for Sinister Forces, was to basically beat the reader into submission by saying here it is these are the facts these are the facts these are the facts you can take an isolated case uh, and try to destroy the case in an isolated way but if you put everything together and you see in front of you the web of connections it becomes harder and harder in the first place to discount them and in the second place you're kind of forced to come up with some explanation as to why all of these things have these these connections uh, if you're a mainstream historian, you're going to take one particular instance and you're going to analyze it to death, right? Which is what you're supposed to do. You're going to footnote it and do all the rest of it. Well, I footnote sinister forces and give bibliographies and primary source material for so many different events um, that it's only when you get to the third volume, I think, do you begin to see, oh, okay, it's all pulling together this way. And this is why, you know, you've been so insistent that I know everything from you know, the Indian burial mounds of Ashland, Kentucky, to the Salem witchcraft trials, to Hollywood in the 1960s, there's there's a method to this madness. And the haunted house opening in Disneyland. Well, the same day as the Tate killings, yeah. And uh, on the same day, a year later, Richard Nixon would declare Charles Manson was guilty, which should have resulted in a mistrial, which didn't. And a year after that, Nixon, uh, not a year after that, four years after that, to the day Nixon leaves office as president. So that date in August keeps showing up uh, in connection with Manson, Nixon, and what Robin Williams calls the Manson-Nixon line, which is pretty... <laughs> which, yeah, which I, uh, <laughs> yeah, which I love, which kind of seems amazing coming from him, but... Yeah, really, but it, it, he, put the, he put his finger on it. There was, there was a kind of reciprocal relationship here that's really bizarre. Why would Nixon who was a lawyer and trained as a lawyer, go out of his way to the state before the trial was over that Charles Manson was guilty. And, of course, Manson is holding up the newspaper in court showing the jurors, uh, hoping for a mistrial. If the president says I'm guilty, what chance do I have? Um, and yet it didn't result in a mistrial. The judge simply asked the jury, do you guys you know, pay any attention to anything at all that Richard Nixon says? And they said no. <laughs> so they, they that well. sounds like that's a whole other subject yeah. there. <laughs> If, if we can bring in now another connection, so we've gone through, you know, and, and again, we're just kind of thumbnailing a lot of this. The connections are go so much deeper. And again, we implore folks to go out there and do the research and do the reading for themselves. But we have Polanski and Tate involved in the occult and the Manson murders and Susan Atkins. I didn't know that John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas was investigated by Roman Polanski for his possible involvement in the murder of Sharon Tate? Yes. Uh, for a little while, there was a suspicion. I mean, Polanski did not know what to expect or what to believe about the murders. He was hearing all kinds of stories. He was hearing stories of orgies going on at the Tate house. He was hearing stories of occult rituals. Uh, he was hearing all kinds of things, drug uh, involvements involving uh, the people living at, uh, at the house on Cielo Drive. And one of, the, one of the connections, one of the things that he um, had a problem with, Polanski had once slept with um, Michelle Phillips. I mean, he had had an affair briefly with John Phillips' wife, Michelle Phillips, who's, of course, the famous actress. She was in uh, TV series like Knott's Landing and things like that. So uh, here he is, you know, Polanski sleeping with Michelle Phillips, and now he thinks that maybe John Phillips murdered his wife in retaliation. So there is this idea that maybe, you know, there's a, there's a John Phillips connection to the Polanski case. Um, there was also a connection uh, that maybe there was a voodoo cult involved uh, in the in the murders, you know, because of all the, the bizarre symbolism that was taking place. And Polanski had reason to believe there was an occult or voodoo connection. He had reason to believe that John Phillips, you know, might have killed Sharon. 
because Polanski himself was a philanderer. I mean, he was sleeping with Michelle Phillips. We have to remember this was the 1960s. Um, <laughs> it was the era of Pretty sexual long. revolution uh, before AIDS, you know, so there was a lot of stuff going on like that. Well, and then, so if we now flash forward to the present, or, or <laughs> not quite, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Years after all of these things, Polanski again finds himself in a world of trouble with something going down at Jack Nicholson's house. Yeah, well, of course, that's the famous case that we're talking about these days. And don't forget that in the middle of that, there was also the uh, the rumored, or I don't know if it was proven, affair with Nastasia Kinski as well, uh, okay. who at the time was 15 years old, I think. And I think uh, a lot of times folks confuse the two and actually think that this case concerned Natasha Kinski. No, I, yeah, I, no, I it's a different case. Yeah, okay. yeah the, the, the Kinski case never really became a legal uh, problem to the extent that the one with... Um, with his his the thirteen year old uh, young lady Samantha Geimer, Geimer is, yeah. is her name, right? So well, let me first ask you: Have you seen the documentary Wanted and Desired? Oh yes, okay. Sure. I feel like that really does shed a lot of light on just the sort of legal misconduct, and this is one of those stories that's you know tailor made for you know the water cooler, and it's turned into the classic story of. It's middle America versus Hollywood. And then when Woody Allen signs his name to a petition, it's, you know, lots sure. of lots of moralizing. But I think, the, the, again, there's a lot more that kind of surrounds surrounds all of this. Yeah, well, the film um, was, was a very, very well done documentary. Unfortunately, as we know now, the prosecutor in that film lied to the filmmakers um, that he had advised the judge uh, to prosecute Polanski and throw him in jail. Uh, the prosecutor was, you know, since been interviewed and said, I lied because I thought the film would only show in France. Uh, I don't know what kind of reasoning that was, but anyway, that's what he said. So there was that one problem with the film. But otherwise, if we look at it, um, there's a lot of moralizing about this story at the moment. Um, and a lot of it's understandable. But um, there was a plea agreement, you know. Uh, Polanski was sent to Chino uh, State Prison uh, for a 90-day evaluation by prison officials who said that he did not they did not recommend prison for him that should have been the end of it uh the pre the plea agreement was signed i think by uh, samantha's mother everybody was in agreement and then suddenly the judge decided he was not going to honor the agreement and that's when uh, polanski left town and never came back so it, it's a struggle here to find out what is legally right versus what may be morally right uh, ethically right or anything else Polanski was only convicted um, of statutory rape, but a lot of the stories that are going out involve all kinds of other things, right, that uh, we all assume Polanski was guilty of, and which he probably, you know, was guilty of. But from a legal perspective, the plea agreement was a done deal, and then Polanski got the shaft, basically, from the legal system. And as somebody who lived through the Holocaust, someone who saw the LAPD make a mess of the investigation of the murder of his wife and his unborn child, I think it's understandable that Polanski would have said, I'm not hanging around, I'm getting out of here. Uh, there's guilty conscience, guilty knowledge involved in this as well, I'm certain. So, you know, I can't come down on one side or the other 100%. But if we do believe in uh, our system of laws... Uh, and we do kind of believe that if a plea agreement is reached and everybody agrees to it that it's a done deal and then it's not, um, then we have a problem with the legal system. I mean, he was politically uh, indicted and then he, he escaped. And now after the film, they decided to go after him again. The whole thing seems political from, from, you know, from, from all sides. So from my point of view, it's hard for me to come up with, an, uh, with, a, with a statement that says, yes, bring him back and throw him in jail, or no, don't. Uh, there's a problem with both points of view. Or as Cokie Roberts said the other day, we should just just take him out and shoot him. This yeah. is the sort of... <laughs> there's, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> so what, I, I suppose, what do you expect to maybe see happen with him? Is this something that could go on for months and months and months and we won't really see anything immediate? Or I, I personally wouldn't be surprised if we saw them make a quick deal and he shows up here. Yeah, I think they might do that because this has become a hot potato uh, for so many reasons. Um, Polanski also, has, has the right to say, well, what about, for instance, uh, Michael Kennedy Smith 
right? Um, here's one of the Kennedy clan who was uh, accused of uh, statutory rape, uh, I think of a 15-year-old, uh, never spent a day in jail. You know, um, he could point to a lot of other uh, individuals who uh, have been accused of the same things and had not gotten this kind of, of, of attention or treatment. So I think there's going to be a lot of uh, legal, legal machinations going on on both sides. I don't know if California really wants to retry this case right now. I think you know? it's, it's interesting to know, too, that, and fortunately some folks have pointed out that, gosh, you guys sure are spending a lot of money on this when you've recently had to let tens of thousands of people out of the prisons because California, yep. as we know, is going broke. Sure. So and it's you're kind of spend all this money to bring this guy back. Exactly, it's kind of bad political and financial timing on on their part. But I think it was the film. I think the film really got everybody thinking. We're, we're, we're looking bad. Uh, we have to fix this. We have to bring Polanski back. They didn't quite get the whole point of the film, I think. But th- what they saw was there was bad publicity for for Los Angeles, bad publicity for the court system. Uh, bring the guy back and, and enforce him to you know force him to, to to do his sentence at the same time get him for you know unlawful flight to evade prosecution and all the rest of it so uh, this is this is not going to go away easily but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a really uh, uh, secretive deal behind the scenes to get this thing over with in, in a hurry nobody wants to be watching this for the next year and a half and and <laughs> Again, the, the connections are all labyrinthine, but I do find it really, in a, in a way, really positive that documentary films can make, you know, actual, oh, yeah. you know, kind of political and social change. So it's not just, you know, the sort of homemade documentaries of, you know, loose change and 9-11 truth and, and these other kind of fields, but also mainstream films. Something like uh, The Thin Blue Line by Errol right. Morris was a documentary that essentially examined evidence that had been long forgotten or, or misunderstood and brought new evidence to light, and I think it essentially got a guy out of prison. Yes. So, yeah, so they, they do, there is power in, in Hollywood. There is power in, in not just documentary films, but even uh, thinly fictionalized accounts of things. Uh, Hollywood has that ability to shape consciousness, to manipulate reality even, um, which is one of the, the themes of my book as well. But uh, Hollywood does have that, that power. Uh, And you're dealing with individuals in the business who are, by their very nature, emotionally unstable by any other metric that you may want to use uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, Hollywood deals with people who, um, especially the actors and actresses who have to become somebody else for extended periods of time. Um, If if you look at the method created by Stanislavski, you know, uh, Stanislavski himself, this, this, the famous actor's method of becoming your character, uh, he understood this was an occult process. This was a mystical process. He, he likened it to yoga and to other forms of uh, mystical identity. Uh, we're dealing with people who are not always what they appear to be. So we're, we have people like that who are um, fashioning our reality. I mean, we still go to the movies, you know, as bad as the economic situation can be as it was during the depression and the years after the depression film was our church you know we go to a a big room we sit in pews facing the front it's dark and we enter into a mystical communion with whatever's happening on the screen and it it alters our reality documentaries can do that but so can every other film and that might be a good thing and it might be a bad thing you know um, uh, the image of the United States abroad is created largely by Hollywood. Absolutely, people people overseas watch American movies and they think that's America. You know, um, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I was born in the Bronx, and I'm always amazed, or I used to be always amazed, when I would see films about New York City that showed New York City as this horrible pit of violence and decay and mayhem. You know, where I lived there and I traveled constantly on the subways and never saw an act of violence in my life when I was there. But at the same time, you know. The reality gets created. New York is a dangerous place. It's a horrible place. Well, that's something actually that the late comedian Bill Hicks used to mention about, you know, spending too much time watching too much cable news and it's all war, famine, death, war. And you look at your window and it's crickets. Where's all this happening? Really? Exactly. Well, I lived overseas uh, for an extended period of time. I lived in Asia and they made a film about uh, Kuala Lumpur um, with um, Sean Connery. Uh, about a, a, a heist, a, a money heist. And they showed Kuala Lumpur, the, 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 the tallest buildings in the world at the time, the Twin Towers. Um, and it was, you know, 
beautifully filmed at the same time the Malaysians were very upset because it wasn't real. I mean, there were certain vistas, there were certain uh, scenes that were set that could not possibly have taken place in Kuala Lumpur, you know, and it made Malaysia look bad. And I said to them, well, welcome to the club, you know. I'm from New York. I mean, you think New York is this horrible place and it's filled with gangsters and criminals and people are shooting each other in the street constantly. Uh, I said, and the same is true uh, now with you. You've joined the club. You've joined, you know, the rest of us who have to deal with a created reality, which is nowhere near the real reality. I mean, CNN can't report reality. Um, they have a very hard time. I mean, I watched CNN... Uh, in Asian countries, well, outside my window was the very scene CNN was describing, and it was wrong, you know. CNN would show you a riot of thousands of people, when actually the riot was maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 people shot from different angles. Tight you know? camera angle, yeah. Tight camera, yeah. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. We would sit there and laugh. We would watch television, look out the window, and see this total disconnect between what was being filmed and the reality, and we thought it was hysterical. But, you know... Um, now, I, is, I would throw in something, fortunately, now that that has changed, is that we do now have the ability for those people to lean out the window with their small video phone yep. and do the citizen journalism and say, look, they're not telling the truth, and you put that up, and you can get just as many visitors as, as anyone else online. Sure. And that's important right now. There's a lot of you know complaints about citizen journalism. It's not as you know professional, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's needed. I think we need to see this alternate uh, point of view. You watch it all. You know, watch CNN and watch the citizen journalism as well, and come up to your you know come up with your own conclusions. But reality is being manipulated. Uh, it's being manipulated on a daily basis. We are being, uh, I think, we're being made sick, for instance, by uh, television commercials, which are for pills, which spend most of the commercial telling you what you know what the side effects are. <laughs> you know, very, I hear the yeah, I hear these side effects voice. constantly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, my goodness, you can die, you can go insane, you can lose this, you can lose that. This will happen, that'll happen, and we hear this constantly repeated day after day after day. It becomes part of your consciousness. I'm always surprised when I hear folks drive by and they have their car stereos on and they're listening to commercials in their right. car, and you know that to them they probably don't even notice it anymore. Right. If I can throw another film reference and connection into the into the mix here, when we were talking about John Phillips and the Mamas and the Papas and the accusations of incest, this, for me, brings up one of Polanski's other most famous films. If his three, big three, that will probably, you know, he's most connected with is the most recent being The Pianist, which, of course, he was not able to come to the States to pick up his Best Director Oscar for that film. Yep. Rosemary's Baby from 68, but we also have from, I believe, 72, is Chinatown. Right. Can you can you flesh that out a little bit? Or well, if you know where I'm going? <laughs> well, I mean, you, you brought up incest, so there you go. Um, you know... Um, that, that's essentially, in, in the film Chinatown, that's the big reveal, is, right. is that it's, it's not his wife, it's his daughter. Yeah. So, exactly. hey, Dunaway, very great, a great film, by the way. And mm -hmm. Jack Nicholson was was terrific in that. And there's Jack Nicholson again. Yeah, exactly. You know, Nicholson and Polanski. I don't know what was going on with those two. Um, I don't know who was whose wingman in this case. You know what I mean? But uh, <laughs> there was Nicholson and, and Polanski, and of course, Nicholson's estate was where the famous uh, Samantha, you know, uh, case had taken place. Um, but yeah, Nicholson was definitely part of that. Um, what, what do you want to talk about Chinatown in particular? Because there's so many different weird um, associations we could do, I suppose. I suppose, uh, aside from just being incest being the kind of main underlying current, the other would be the connections of Robert Evans, the producer of the film. Well, yeah, I was afraid you would go there. <laughs> How much more time do you have? We've got as much time as we can as we can use. Well, Bob Evans is to me a fascinating. Uh, character And this is all for me relatively new. I, I know of the guy. I've heard of him before. He kind of, in the last several years, kind of had a resurge and had a public face. He had a documentary and a book made about him, interestingly enough, with the title, The Kid Stays in the Picture. Yep. <laughs> and Dustin Hoffman did a great uh, imitation of Bob Evans, if you saw the end of that film. Uh, I couldn't believe how, how well he did Evans. But anyway, um, Bob Evans is... Oh wow! I mean, when you t when you start with him, then you're, you're talking about the entire thesis, practically, of sinister forces. I mean, he connects everything to everything. Um, Evans, of course, was the producer for Rosemary's Baby. 
Um, he was the guy who got that film made. Uh, Polanski was the director, but Evans was the producer. So the relationship between Evans and Polanski goes back to that time. Bob Evans then wanted to make a movie called The Cotton Club. Uh, he couldn't get funding for it. And the funding kept falling through. All kinds of bizarre people got involved trying to finance that film, uh, including drug dealers, uh, including some strange Middle Eastern types who wanted to, uh, to, to, to get involved with that film. There was a lot of cocaine flowing around in those days. And at some point, Bob Evans gets involved in a murder investigation. And the murder investigation um, involves uh, the death of a, of a film producer called Roy Radin, a guy who was based in Long Island, uh, who went out to California, who was trying to get involved in the Cotton Club deal in some way, was involved with someone else who was uh, dealing drugs, uh, huge amounts of cocaine. Uh, this again was the 70s. It was cocaine territory for anybody who was around at that time. And Raiden gets uh, murdered. He winds up dead in the desert uh, outside of Los Angeles. They find his body years, uh, not years, but sometime later, um, with a biblical, with a Bible open to a verse from Isaiah. It was all very weird and very staged. And Evans is involved in this. I mean, he, he was uh, picked up. He was questioned. Uh, he was never um, charged with the crime. He was never indicted for it. But he was a person of interest for a long time. And it's mentioned briefly, I believe, in that in that documentary, the kid stays in the picture, but it was a it was a major um, event in Bob Evans' life. But with Evans, we suddenly find all of these tendrils going out because the murder of Roy Radin was committed by a person they believe was involved with the original Manson family, and that's where it gets very spooky because this is ten years later, and suddenly there's another murder. There's a murder by someone that uh, the occult investigator, the, uh, the occult criminal, the occult crime investigator, Maury Terry, uh, called Manson II, um, a, a person who was supposedly had picked up the mantle of Charles Manson once Charlie was in jail and was carrying out the same types of murders and assassinations. Um, so we have a connection between Roy Radin, uh, the murder of, uh, of Roy Radin, of Bob Evans, of Charles Manson, Manson II, and then back to New York to the son of Sam Case. And all of this is is connected through individuals, through events. Uh, it goes back to our famous uh, to the famous October twelfth date, which we should probably mention in passing. Um, a, a date that comes up a lot in the Manson case. It comes up again in the Son of Sam case. Uh, October twelfth is the, is uh, well Columbus Day uh, for most of us. Ah, well that's uh, there there. That's a great place to set the foundation I, I suppose for the october 12th date if we're talking about america being a haunted house well yeah we could start with october 12th we can start with columbus um and it goes up to alistair crowley and his birthday alistair crowley being a famous occultist and magician and connected to as as we i think briefly mentioned before l ron hubbard and then that gets into jack parsons and the occult and babylon working and scientology and and all of that but and on and you're off to the races <laughs> exactly. so so you see no matter who we mention <laughs> in this no matter who we mention in this we're going to find two or three handshakes away you know the six degrees of separation in a study like this really goes down to two or three degrees of separation when I mean, you're only two or three handshakes away from from incredibly weird uh, events and circumstances, which are then connected to incredibly important political uh, and, and criminal events in our, our nation's history. Um, it, it's I, I, I'm speechless sometimes and even trying to describe it because you, you can become overwhelmed by the amount of data, which nobody else is is looking at. I mean, there's so much data that is not being investigated. But at any rate. Uh, to go back to Evans, uh, the murder of Roy Radin, the son of Sam Case, um, all of these things, uh, Terry demonstrated to be connected. A lot of people have a problem with Terry's book, The Ultimate Evil, because he tries to pin everything on the process church of the final judgment, uh, which is probably a little bit in error, but I could see why he would think this was, was, was correct. And we talk about the process church, again, we're going to talk about Scientology, because it was an offshoot of Scientology created by former Scientology members. We're going to talk about Charles Manson because Manson was um, uh, appeared in one of the issues of the Process Church's magazine in an article entitled Fear that he wrote. 
We're going to go back from there to the Rolling Stones, and we're going to go back to Marianne Faithful and Anita Pallenberg and Kenneth Unger, all the occult films that were coming out of, uh, of California in the 60s. Uh, it's just... And we're going to go to the Son of Sam case. So the I'm, I'm afraid your listeners are going to become extremely... Um, confused by all of this and I sympathize with them <laughs> it can be very confusing I had to create enormous databases to keep track of the names to keep track of the organizations because they kept showing up and showing up very much like the Watergate case where you had E. Howard Hunt you know, as one of the Watergate burglars the people uh, breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel or the Watergate uh, uh, office complex Andy Howard Hunt had already been the action officer in charge of the Bay of Pigs invasion, a former CIA agent, uh, then left the CIA, quote-unquote, uh, joined a company called Robert Mullen, um, which was run by Mormons. There's another story in there. Uh, and then Howard Hunt, of course, involved with Watergate, and then later on his deathbed last year, admitting that he was in Dallas, November 63, on the day that Kennedy was assassinated, and admitting there was a conspiracy to kill the president. Uh, e. Howard Hunt, uh, the author of three occult novels, you know, I mean, living on a place called Witch's Island. I mean, it's just, if you start pulling at the threads of this thing, you're going to go insane. You're going to become uh, incredibly paranoid, or you're going to get extremely um, uh, uh, impatient with all of it, you know, and say, I'm not going to look at this anymore because it's just too insane. I, I, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately. I haven't, I think, reached either of those points in a way learning and seeing the connections in all of these things I think serves to really inform you and and makes you in, almost in a way less paranoid just like looking at a, you know what's going on just a little more outside our doors as we see an economy collapsing and a seeming police state being erected and all of these things but being aware ahead of time kind of in a way makes it a little less scary can I stop all of these things Probably not. Am I changing the world from my little blog? Probably not. But with a little bit more information, I think it can help us all not to be so shocked when we wake up and see that something happens. We can see when something happens and say, ah, that's important because it connects to this, this, and that. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't, I don't think, at least uh, not at this point, I haven't run down the street pulling my hair out screaming that. <laughs> <laughs> then you haven't finished reading the course. <laughs> Well, uh, there was the case, for instance, people who wanted to, to wonder where all this began, uh, without going back to Columbus at the moment, but we just have to go back to the 1950s. The Cold War was, was terribly important to the direction our country took uh, at the end of World War II, and the direction we're still on, we just can't seem to get out of. The Cold War, to my mind, started all of this, and the, the type of uh, deals with the devil we were willing to make at the end of World War II. If we think about, um, I talk about in the first volume, the, the story about the Nine, uh, about Andrea Puharich, who became famous uh, in our country for having discovered Yuri Geller, you know, the Israeli psychic who could bend spoons with his mind. Uh, that's all we really know if we ever hear the name Andrea Puharich, but actually he was, uh, had, had medical training. Uh, he worked for the U.S. Army. He had, a, he had a commission during the Korean War. And his great claim to fame was the fact that he was trying to weaponize paranormal abilities. He was trying to sell the Army on the idea that we could weaponize extrasensory perception. We could weaponize a psychokinesis or telekinesis, the ability to move objects at a distance. He was very much uh, involved in this and was giving lectures to the Army about how to do this. Um, at the same time, he was conducting seances at a barn, uh, an estate that he had up in Maine, where he got some of the wealthiest, most famous names. And this is fully documented. It's documented by Puharich himself, but it's also documented by the uh, records of the people involved. You can look this up also. There's no mystery about this. We had people like Ruth Forbes Payne, the heir to the Forbes fortune, a relative of John Kerry. We had um, a DuPont. We had an Astor. We had all the famous blue blood American names represented at these seances in the dead of winter on New Year's Eve in Maine in 1953, I believe it was, 52 to 53. And they're, they're invoking spiritual forces. There were nine people in the seance, and they were contacted, according to Paharich's records and the records of others, 
by some kind of agency, some extraterrestrial spiritual agency that called itself the Nine and told these nine individuals you're going to go out and you're going to make a big influence on the world. You're going to change the, the course of American destiny and, and global destiny. A DuPont, a Forbes, and a Payne, a, a descendant of one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. Um, the actor John Treat Williams is a, Treat Williams rather is a descendant. is part of the same family, uh, the Payne family. So they're all in this room in the 19, in 1952, conducting the séance. One of the primary members is a guy called Arthur Young. Arthur Young uh, was the inventor of the Bell helicopter a brilliant engineer who left engineering at the end of World War II to devote his life completely to the study of the paranormal. He's married to Ruth Forbes Payne. Uh, her, she's from the Forbes family. She had married a Payne. Uh, she had a son called Michael Payne, uh, Arthur Young's stepson. Michael Payne is married to Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne is the woman who brings in Lee Harvey Oswald and Marina Oswald to stay with her in Dallas while Lee goes and finds a job. It's, I mean, it's incredible. A few months before the assassination, Ruth Payne goes up to visit Arthur Young and Ruth Forbes Payne Young and, you know, hang out with them for a while. She comes back into Dallas, and within two months, there's the assassination of the president. I mean, two handshakes away, you know, two degrees of separation between Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas and a seance taking place in Maine ten, ten years earlier. And um, you can't make was it one of was it the very Astor that was at this seance who would then no it, no it couldn't have been then my timetable's off is there a Titanic connection I'm sorry right that was John Jacobs Astor that was the ancestor of the Astor who was at the seance right okay and it, but again another connection the same family to a yeah. big seminal you know sure. historical event absolutely the same family in fact it was at the Astor's estate in England. Um, where we have the connection to the Profumo affair, which for those of you who are history buffs, in 1962 there was a, a scandal involving the British uh, Prime Minister, or actually a British War Minister called John Profumo. He was sleeping with a prostitute um, who was also sleeping with a Soviet uh, military attaché, and it brought down the government of England. Well, uh, the person who was at the center of this of this scandal was a guy called Stephen Ward. Stephen Ward was an occultist, uh, allegedly a member of the Golden Dawn. I haven't been able to find documents to prove that, but he was definitely involved with the occult, with seances, with that sort of thing. Uh, Stephen Ward lived on the Astor estate in England, and after he died, he was arrested for uh, somehow being involved with Christine Keeler, who was the, the young woman who was sleeping with both Profumo and the Soviets. Uh, she became famous. Stephen Ward was arrested for his participation in this. Uh, he committed suicide in prison, and they brought in priests to exorcise the cottage he lived in on the Astor estate. They have since found documents, uh, FBI documents, that show that Keeler was actually in New York City and in the United States uh, in the 60s, uh, before the Profumo affair hit, and uh, there's an alleged connection with Jack Kennedy, who was in New York City at the same time. And that, of course, has not been proven, but it's given rise to a lot of speculation. Uh, so without making too much of that connection, we have the Astor estate in England, we have Stephen Ward, occultism, the downfall of the British government, um, and then at the same time, we have the Astors having seances in the 50s in Maine, and then a connection to the Kennedy assassination in 1963. Um, and there were more connections between the Nine and the Kennedy assassination. That wasn't the only one. Uh, George de Morenschild, who was the Russian emigre, uh, a CIA contact agent, uh, contract agent rather, who had befriended Oswald, um, also was connected to the Nine uh, through his friend Paul Wasson, who was one of the people uh, investigating the psychotropic properties of magic mushrooms in Mexico for Andrea Puharich and the military. It's just this tight little incestuous group of people who all knew each other, who were all in bed together, sometimes literally, usually figuratively, and who are at, this, at, at the, the, the tangent points of American history, of our history of our country. They were very much involved in this in the historical events that took place, the seminal events like assassinations, at the same time, they're very much involved in the occult and the paranormal. 
It's a fascinating study, and it's been ignored because of the occult trappings. Historians are a little nervous about investigating the occult uh, because they could lose their credibility, quite frankly, with their with other academics. So I understand it, but what we're doing is we're avoiding a major a major um, source of information as to what really goes on in this country and who's doing what to whom and what the motivations might be. So the tight connections between all of these kind of major seminal events brings me to something, and I probably wouldn't have necessarily mentioned it, but you actually said the words, and so I'll so I'll mention it when you were talking about Kuala Lumpur. You mentioned the Twin Towers. The events of 9-11, I don't know that that's really something that you've done a whole lot of work or investigation on. What's your, I guess, personal take on the the whole realm? I've, I've avoided... Uh, writing about it too much for a number of reasons. One, everybody else seems to do pretty well without me. <laughs> but uh, in the second place, I have uh, I have problems, of course. There's no question I have problems with the 9-11 Commission and with the story we've been told. My, the, To me, the linchpin of the problem I have with 9-11 is Tower 7. Tower 7, for me, if we can explain that, we'll be able to understand what really happened because to- the collapse of Tower 7 made no sense whatsoever. Forget, you know, can a plane cause a tower to collapse? I've heard engineers from both sides try to defend that story. Uh, forget the hole in the side of the Pentagon that doesn't make sense if it's an airplane going through it. All those other things, you know, everybody else is handling. Uh, and, of course, they're handling Tower 7 too. But all I have to do to, to convince people there's something else going on is I ask them, what about Tower 7? You know, I've avoided writing about this number one because everybody is writing about it there's a lot of coverage on it that you know people are focused on it it's these uh, it's for me it's you know it's these the similar event of, of my generation it was the it's you yeah. know and not to put it in these kind of boxes where it just sounds like it's some kind of stupid hobby or something but i was going to say that it's you know my generation's jfk but again no, i don't i don't want to make it sound like it's it's really cool to be into you know 911 truth because i don't want it to be some kind of social club but no, of course, and I agree with that. But uh, for me, the the importance of 9-11 uh, came home to me immediately when it happened. I sat, I was in Kuala Lumpur when it happened, and I was watching it on the internet because television in, in Malaysia was not covering it immediately. They didn't know what to do with it they did, because it's heavily censored uh, there, so they didn't know really how to present the news, uh, so they didn't even talk about it for a while. But I'm watching the towers go down, and I'm thinking, like everybody thought, this is a joke, it's a hoax. Uh, and then I realized it was true. I, I, I worked there. I mean, I worked within a block of the towers. I used to travel there every day for four years. I saw the towers going up. For me, it has a lot of associations. But when I saw the towers go down, my first reaction was, knowing that, you know, with the president that we had and knowing his proclivities, I said to myself, this is our Reichstag fire. Like, it doesn't matter if we brought it down, if uh, they brought it down, whoever they is, whoever we are, what really matters is how we're going to handle it. It's going to be our excuse to do whatever we want to do in the world. It was like the Reichstag fire was for Hitler. Hitler had the parliament building. Well, he became chancellor. The parliament building went on fire. He had to burn down, more or less. Uh, he immediately blamed it on communists without having a shred of evidence. He just blamed it on communists. And if he used that as the excuse to take complete dictatorial power in Germany. For me, 9-11 was a Reichstag fire. Did Al-Qaeda bring it down? Did a bunch of Muslims, non-Muslims, Saudis, whoever, take it down? Was it their own idea? Did they come up with it themselves? In the end, we can chase our tails on this. And it's important to know. I'm not belittling that. But the most immediate concern is what do we do with the event? How do we handle that event? And we handle it as we did. We handled it like a Reichstag fire. Okay, America's being attacked. Now it's up to us to to do whatever we have to do to find the perpetrators to invade countries to you know kill maim whatever take away our liberties with the patriot act do whatever it is that we have to do because of 911 it gave too much power too much centralized power and that's the thing that that frightened me living as i did on the other side of the world in a muslim country uh i'm looking at this and thinking oh great you know now what now i got to get out of dodge you know because here i am an american i'm in a muslim country and things are going to get pretty hot you know, they're going to get dicey. Uh, so my reaction was typical, I think, of a lot of expatriates who were living uh, in those circumstances. They looked at that and said, oh, my goodness. You know, I know how we're going to react as Americans. We're going to react with brute force immediately. That's the way we're going to react. 
Um, what else? What other, what other option did we have? I don't know. Maybe we had no other option. But I knew that the the damage that was going to be done uh, was going to be considerable uh, for a long time because of those towers going down. And I didn't see the worst of it until I came back to the United States. Uh, I flew back in October. Uh, we flew over Manhattan uh, to make our approach to Newark Airport from uh, from KL, and uh, it was still smoldering. The site was still smoking. Um, we flew over it, and the entire plane load of passengers, of course, was deadly quiet. Uh, no one said a word. No one. No one. They just stared. Um, and then it was only then, when I arrived in the states, that I actually saw the footage of what had what had actually taken place. Because in Malaysia, you, you they would not show you human casualties. All you saw were the two buildings coming down. Uh, it was only when I got to the U.S. that I was able to see all the, the file footage and the video footage and the still photography of the absolute horror of that moment. So um, it, it, for me, it was very emotional. It was very personal. And uh, I decided that I'm not going to write about this right away. Everybody else is going to jump on this, I know. Let them do it for a while. Let them uncover what they can. They're in a better position to do it. Me in Malaysia, what am I going to find out? You know, virtually nothing. Except that coincidences being what they are, as I found out uh, in a year or two later, some of the planning for that event took place in Kuala Lumpur, not too far from where I was living. So there was a connection there anyway. I, I hadn't thought of it until you just now said it. But yes, on this last, on the eighth anniversary, I, I did a whole, you know, sort of two-hour show and went over kind of my own 11 main points of contention with the story. And yes, one of those being that we had tracked, you know, two of the hijackers to meetings going on in, in Malaysia. That's right. And uh, that's uh, connected with a group called Jama'a Islamiyah, which is uh, a, a kind of an Al-Qaeda wannabe. They want to establish the caliphate, you know, in, uh, in all of Southeast Asia. Uh, so they have connections definitely back to, to, uh, to Al-Qaeda. So, you know, the connections were there. I mean, there's no question that there was an Al-Qaeda connection. Um, so, but as you say, there are bones of contention. I mean, there are, there's a lot of holes in the story, a lot of holes in the story. Um, for me, the, the most glaring one is okay. Well, talk, explain to me Tower Seven. You know, <laughs> just explain that that's, to me. What was that all about? That's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. And if folks, you know, even know anything about it, that's that's even rare. A lot, you know, a lot of times people haven't even haven't even heard of it. But we don't we don't have to go fully fully into nine eleven. It was just something that you know sure. that, that that again, as I said, is something that really got me. You know, got my eyes open to I think all the bizarre connections through the world and and with the internet era just as you said it was a story you didn't necessarily need to jump on because there was this whole new generation of people who exactly. had kind of you know new tools to still be able to do the same kind of you know muckraking and exposés but you could now do it with such you know ease and connectivity that we you know that we've never seen before and hopefully something that we won't lose i suppose well, that's that's a that's a point uh, I think we should make is the fact that this the, the internet in general is a kind of a of a democracy. I mean, uh, in reality, um, you can go and find out what you need. You can go and say you know what you what you want. I mean, everybody is pretty much equal on the internet. Um, you don't know the information you're getting if it's very good or not. You don't know if it's made up. If some guy is you know, strung out on some hallucinogen and he's typing in stuff, you have no clue. But there's a kind of uh, um, power inherent in it that I've had discussions with o overseas quite frequently when people complain about globalization, which they do. Of course, people in foreign countries are particularly sensitive to globalization and, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. And then I tell them, well, you know, there's, there's an upside to this. And that is you go online from uh, almost any village anywhere in developing countries there's a capability of getting on and making your story known or connecting with other people with similar stories and creating communities that are virtual communities but nonetheless real in a sense you know you're exchanging information this is uh, the possibility of resistance to authoritarian uh, rule is there and the technology is such that you know governments can do what they can as they try to do in china as they try to do in some of the southeast asian countries to censor the internet you know to to channel the news to to control it but that never really works for very long there are some brilliant people out there who find ways around it um and it's going on all the time you really can't stop the flow of information 
But at the same time, you can't stop the flow of disinformation either. <laughs> so you have to be pretty wise in how you handle what comes across the screen. Well, we've pretty much hit uh, a lot of, I think, the, the kind of main points in the last hundred years of murky American and also world history. And so as we start to start to wrap it up here, we, we did go on record about October 12th, which will be this coming Monday, that, you know, we're not making any grand predictions, but it's been in the past a date of note, so we wouldn't be surprised to see something perhaps related to Polanski or Manson or the occult or, or something something related there. But what we also have coming up very soon is Halloween. So, are there things specifically that you've been tracking or that you've been working on? And we can actually, of course, spend a little bit of time talking about, actually, you have several more recent books than Sinister Forces. I believe your latest is called The Secret Temple? Yes. Well, The Secret Temple is about Freemasonry. Um, I was always kind of interested in the idea of secret societies and why people are so afraid of them and, and why should they be afraid of them, why they should be suspicious of them, and why should even exist a, a society like Freemasonry always mystified me as to, you know, well, if, 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 they're, not, if they're benign, then why all the secrecy, right? I mean, there's, there's kind of a disconnect between the face they present to the world and, you know, what they really represent. So I was fascinated by that, um, fascinated by the idea of an occult calendar the Son of Sam case, uh, I believe, employed an occult calendar, which means the, the, the pagan holidays as opposed to the Christian ones. Um, in this case, Halloween is part of the occult calendar. It's uh, an ancient festival called Samhain, which is uh, you know the Day of the Dead. But also April 30th, uh, Walpurgisnacht, which is the day that uh, Hitler supposedly committed suicide, um, was an important day in the pagan calendar as well. Um, in fact, those of you who watch the History Channel, I spoke about this a little bit uh, in a show that was on recently uh, called Hitler's Blood Oath on the History Channel, uh, talking about the relevance of that date um, as, a pagan, as a pagan holiday. So April 30th, uh, uh, Halloween, of course, October 30th, and uh, April 30th also is the date that Saigon fell, for instance, um, in 1975, when the communists took over that country. It was also the day that, of course, uh, Hitler committed suicide. It was really the end of World War II. So there are certain dates that have resonance that uh, that seem to come up a lot. In the Son of Sam case, the, the, they used an occult calendar extensively. Uh, if you plot the killings that took place, you'll see that they occurred on or near occult holidays. Uh, also, there was a lunar connection to the murders. Most of them took place, I believe, during waxing or full moons. I think only one murder possibly took place during a dark moon, and that was one of the murders that I don't believe that Berkowitz committed, um, for other reasons. So there, you, you'll see these patterns emerging. And a man, a, a scientist, mathematician called Mandelbrot, uh, some of your listeners may be familiar, Mandelbrot, the Mandelbrot set is famous in math. It's the, uh, it's concerns fractals and fractal geometry. Well, anyway, Mandelbrot was uh, contacted by Maury Terry, with all of the dates and all of the uh, the instances of the, the Berkowitz letters and the codes that he believed were present in those letters, uh, referring to the existence of a cult, and Mandelbrot himself said, statistically, uh, it's impossible. There has to be a connection. There has to be a connection between the Sam cult, uh, occult activity, and uh, the other things that Terry was investigating. You know, the, the existence of a broader satanic cult, and part of that was the the idea of the calendar. The calendar was an important factor in this. Um, October 12th, Halloween, um, these are dates that the Son of Sam cult used extensively. Uh, there are dates, uh, a very horrific murder took place in California of Arliss Perry on October 12th. She was ritually murdered in a Catholic church uh, at a university uh, church up in, uh, in Northern California near San Francisco. So you have um, this idea that October 12th is significant. Uh, it's significant because it's Aleister Crowley's birthday. Okay, that's one area of significance, perhaps. Um, not everybody who's involved with Aleister Crowley is a satanic killer. Uh, that's just not true. But there are some people who independently take this to heart. When it comes to Halloween, of course, uh, that's been the, the time of, of occult happenings. Sometimes we don't know what these are until after the events. I believe that uh, perhaps within a month or two months after uh, Halloween this year, we may come across the fact that there were a number of strange occurrences that took place that nobody really noticed at the time. 
but that with the passage of time suddenly becomes significant, as what as happened with the, the Son of Sam case. Uh, Tex Watson, um, one of the murderers in the in the Sharon Tate LaBianca killings, uh, was convicted on October 12th. Uh, Charlie Manson himself was arrested on October 12th. Uh, and then I believe he was uh, s- sentenced on December 1st, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which was Crow- the, the date of Crowley's death. So there were, there's a lot of Aleister Crowley dates that permeate through here for whatever reason. Maybe the connection is with Jack Parsons, with Scientology, with the Process Church of the Final Judgment, which was a creature of Scientology. Um, all of these things are connected, but we have to look deeper than the, 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 the surface connections. We have to understand how these events are similar. What do they share in common? What worldview do they share? Uh, the lust for power, for instance, is, is part of it. And the idea that reality can be manipulated and that the weak can be manipulated by the strong or by the knowledgeable. And I think if we look a little bit deeper underneath the surface connections, we're going to see where I, what I call the sinister forces, where the sinister forces live and breathe. Uh, and we realize that people in our governments, people in our academic world, people uh, in the medical fields and other fields have sought to make connections with these sinister forces, wittingly or unwittingly. And they've um, wittingly or unwittingly unleashed these forces uh, onto the world at times. And I think we have to educate ourselves as to how this is done uh, and to try to, f- to trace the evidence for these forces to figure out how our reality is being manipulated uh, on a day-by-day basis. I think that sums it up pretty well. Peter Lavenda, author of Sinister Forces, Unholy Alliance, The Secret Temple... I really, I really admire your work. I appreciate your work. I, you know, it reminds me in a way of, of folks like Lauren Coleman, who does work with, you know, the clusterings and the copycat effect and the dates and things. And yep. also someone like Alex Constantine and, and you guys. Yeah, I, I really admire your work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So is there a, a certain way that folks can follow your work, perhaps get in touch, or, or what's the best way for them to read your work, either through Amazon or just going straight through trinday.com or what's what's best all those are all those are good amazon is good barnes and noble uh, dot com is good or barnes and noble stores are good um trine day of course also i had a blog that i was running on a sinister forces website sinister forces dot info my problem was my blogs kept getting taken down by forces unknown uh, after I put up an article suggesting that maybe John McCain was a Manchurian candidate. It was a tongue-in-cheek kind of article, but for some reason it got a lot of play, a lot of attention around the world. And uh, I logged on one day, and my blog had basically disappeared. Someone had come in and removed that article, the offending article, and a few others. And every time I put it back up, it would disappear again. So I've had a bit of a problem uh, keeping a blog running. I felt like the Mel Gibson, you know, character in conspiracy theory, you know, wondering which one of my conspiracy theories was true, you know. <laughs> How did I get their attention? What did I do? So, um, you can check the uh, the sinister forces.info website from time to time and see if I can manage to get my my blogs up and running again. Okay, uh-huh. I have cuz in in trying to first get in touch with you for this for this interview, I saw that the site was down. I was like, "Ah, oh, what's what's going on?" Oh, it's been attacked. I can't tell you how many times we've been hacked and attacked and everything else. Well, unless uh, you have any last words of (laughs) wisdom or warning, perhaps, for folks. Uh, Just keep the faith, you know. Uh, The the information is there. As uh, Fox Mulder used to say, the truth is out there. It really is. You just have to know where to look and be diligent in picking at the small threads that you find because those little threads will lead to really big connections between people, places, and events. Peter, thanks so much. I'd really love to do this again. I know there are things we could probably do whole episodes on West Virginia and and oh, Moth, yeah. Mothman oh, and the Virginia. Mansons and the Mounds and, and all of those things. A lot of the things that I, I wasn't really aware of until I had moved out to Oregon and started to do more research it was like, oh, the state that I lived in for 28 years had all these strange things going on, and I never quite was aware of it. Oh, yeah. Well, I'd love to do it again, so just to keep me in mind the next time. All right, and anytime, uh, anytime you have work that, one, that you, that you want to try and help get out, we can put it up on the blog and try and spread the word, because, again, that's more essentially what Media Monarchies tried to do, is try to make connections with folks all around the world and just get the word out. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.